speaker line up though, right? Yes. That makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. we will. I've got it right in front of me. So now Sorry. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna hit start. We'll be live as soon as I hit start, okay? Great. Okay. And Monica, before I hit start, are you in? Can you at least Oh, there's Bob. There's Bob. So we got it's oh, frozen. No. Reason. Stop saying there's Bob. Every time we get it, Bob, it, we kick him out. Okay, I'm hitting start. It just freezes. Okay. It just Welcome freezes. to the Thursday installment of the Chicago Responsible Jewelry Conference. We're so excited to have you back again today. We hope you took a couple of minutes to watch the Ethical Metalsmiths Education Committee presentation. It is inspiring and exciting and touching and we have such deep appreciation for these educators that are raising our jewelry students up uh, with responsibility and mind and and helping them gain access to markets with these um these new understandings as i noted in the chat you perhaps saw it we're having technical difficulties so we are waiting for our moderator to join uh, monica stevenson and she's um Hopefully gonna be here in just a moment. And um, another one of our panelists, Bob keeps um, disappearing on us. It's not his fault, but we, every time the picture comes in, he disappears again. So uh, so we're just winging it this afternoon. Let's do it. And um, I do not, I know Monica has formal um, introductions of each of you prepared and I don't. So what I'm gonna do is ask each of you to just introduce yourselves. <laughs> and tell the audience you know, who you are, where you're from, and what your focus is. Um, and why don't we just go in the order that Monica laid out? Because she planned this very well. Uh, OK, so my name's Susie Smither. I'm based in the UK, and I'm the founder of a jewelry brand called The Rock Hound. Um, and I wanted to give you a, like, a little brief overview of how I got to The Rock Hound. Um, so I got into jewelry in about 2007. And I did a, a course um, at Central St. Martin's, just a short course, and I was hooked. I loved studying jewellery. Um, and so then I taught, um, I learned actually in Hatton Garden for four years at a little part-time course. And I was by gemstones from dealers, but I felt kind of really embarrassed. I'd be like, oh, can I have four of those blue ones? And, you know, I just didn't know anything. So I went to the Gemological Association of Great Britain and studied there for nine months and gained my fellowship and I love gems I was like totally hooked jewelry gems and we touched on mining but only in a really short way um we just kind of learned the different aspects of it so it wasn't until I had the opportunity to go to Sri Lanka with the Scottish Gemological Association that I was just struck by the disparity between mine and market I was standing on the edge of a, a small artisanal mine and these miners were like you know digging with their hands back breaking work and i just come from hatton garden where trays of gems are in the windows and everything looks bountiful and plush and gorgeous but you know for miners it's a really tough world so when i came to site in the rock hound in 2015 i really wanted to kind of address that address this kind of the the sever that's happened in the supply chain and so i really wanted to seek out um people who had the same mind as me and so then fast forward to now and um you know it was quite a journey to get here i panicked at the beginning didn't really understand this kind of vast topic got some help along the way from people who um such as levin sources who really helped me to write a code of conduct to get my head around the things i was really passionate about to me it's the human element like you know we we are our lives are attached to the miners so I think it's really important that that's like a two-way thing so mm. I'm at the moment focusing on collections where I, I know fully traceable gems and so then I can add value back down the supply chain as well so that's where I'm at at the moment thank you yeah, our moderator here so I can stop watching <laughs> <laughs> to our pictures real quick because I'd like to introduce Monica and then she can go ahead and take this panel where it's supposed to go. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce the moderator of this session, my friend, Monica Stevenson. Thank you. Oh, we Apparently we can't name you guys. Oh. We say your, your pictures disappear. Oh. Are you still there? Oh, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear yes, you. Yes, we can. Oh, okay. okay. Well, um, yeah. You know what, Andrea? Could I yes. try? Could I try coming in through my computer, which now appears to be 
done with its very surprise backup. So, uh, if, <laughs> all right, um, uh, Susie, I, I can't wait to ask you a few more questions, but give me one second and I can get yeah, back on. Yeah, no, all good, all okay, good. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I'm just telling you guys about Monica while Monica's not here. <laughs> <laughs> time from the panel. So Monica is a writer, a jewelry expert, and an entrepreneur with over 20 years experience in the jewelry industry. She was one of the first bloggers in the jewelry space, um, telling stories about jewelry designers on her award-winning blog, which is idazzle.com. In 2015, she launched Anza Gems, which fuels development in Kenya and Tanzania through fair trade gem purchasing and support. Um, and she's one of the industry partners to Moyo Gems, which is a mine to market project with Tanzania Women Miners Association. So that's who Monica is. So in a very short snippet of who Monica is. Um, and are you back, Monica? She might be trying to log in on one computer while still having the other one open. I see the name here. Right. We'll be patient. You know, for a massive digital undertaking, we've had surprisingly few problems. So <laughs> just what we'll we're roll with it, Andrea. Don't worry. We'll roll with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shall so, we still wait, or can I tell? I'm gonna bump I'm gonna, so, Susie, were you done with that part? And we'll come back to you in a minute. Can, can you? Just, yeah, I mean, I've got more to say, but I, I'll hand it over. I think we'll all kind of introduce perfect. ourselves in the best can way. You, yeah. Can you hear me? Can hear you, Andrea. Oh, can you kick oh. me out? Can you kick me out on <laughs> this link and accept me as I'm knocking uh, on the? Uh, I can. Okay. Thank so, you. Kicking you out. Kick me out. <laughs> Feels like way too much power. Okay. And now where's she knocking? Not the a link with Monica knocking. Now we lost Bob. Here, Bob. Oh, no. I'm just going to say that. Oh. Oh, I, am I back? Can you hear me? Okay. I'm back. Okay. Thank you. And it looks like Monica's on the back. Beautiful. Yay. Here we are. Yeah. Okay. Great. Monica, I finished. Wow. That was, that was amazing. Uh, sorry about that, but. Um, uh, like it, it's you know it's Thursday we're 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 all good so um, uh, thank you for introducing me uh, Andrea thank you so much I heard most of that before I got kicked out so um, I'm so happy to be involved in this particular panel and um, although I'm not a designer per se uh, I work with them daily uh, through my work with Anza Gems and also the collaboration Moyo Gems and also as president of the board of Ethical Metalsmiths this is a question, uh, responsibility in the supply chain and in practices comes up over and over again on our all of our kind of community uh, forums and discussions. So uh, at this point in the conference, I think we've, we've determined that it's very clear that we're dealing with a very complicated and many times opaque supply chain and systems. And, um, and the one, once you actually dig in, it kind of gets worse, uh, or it seems to get worse, actually. And uh, as my friends Christina Miller and uh, Jared Holstein and colleagues say, uh, you have to have an appetite for complexity to kind of engage in this business, right? So, but still we rise. And uh, designers, I'm always impressed that designers willingly lean into this challenge and kind of accept those complexities. Um, one advantage for being later in the conference is that we have a little bit of perspective at this point, right? We've heard about all of these uh, pretty big issues, right? Mercury and the artisanal gold supply chain. We've learned that the Kimberly process does not really address uh, human rights issues in, in that process. And we can't hide behind the term conflict free. Um, we've also um, heard about the gemstone sector and its challenges. So. I hope to kind of, with our guests here, kind of thread the needle a little bit and actually kind of stitch together some, uh, some, some 
uh, practical solutions for what you um, as designers and manufacturers are actually kind of embracing and doing. Uh, we have a community here, so kind of let's lean in and kind of embrace uh, our shared knowledge. And so uh, Susie was kind enough to show some of her images and talk a little bit about her um, experience in the industry. Um, I think you started the Rockhound Five, uh, like in five years ago, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, and you actually contacted me before Tucson. I've known you for a number of years, probably almost that many years. Uh, you yeah. contacted me before Tucson about Anza Gems and wanted to buy from me, and I was in no way like I wasn't exhibiting, I wasn't really ready to like you know really sell anything, but you wanted to meet with me, you wanted to talk, yeah. uh, talk to me. I can neither confirm nor deny there may have been rough gems passed around the bar at the Star Pass, but um, <laughs> if you've been to Tucson, you'll understand that statement. Um, yeah, so, heard of it. <laughs> so, Susie, um, you were kind of, I, I suspect that your big catalyst was kind of your trips to those source communities and yes. really, truly kind of understanding and engaging that, um, yeah. that, that, these materials come from not only somewhere, but someone and, and exactly. that knowledge. So maybe you can yeah. tell us just a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, and once I'd had that kind of moment of like being at the mines, meeting the miners, understanding their struggles, and um, I was overwhelmed, as you say, by the kind of big topic that responsible sourcing is. Um, and yeah. so actually my kind of gem head was like, okay, we'll go to Tucson. If we go and ask lots of people in Tucson, maybe people will have some answers for me. And actually what I found is some people were very closed off. You'd go up to a booth and, and they'd be like, oh, it's from Africa. And you're like, well, you know, you need to be a little bit more specific than that. But then I found people like you, Monica, who are willing to like talk. And if you're willing to talk to me, then I think you're probably willing to talk down the supply chain too. And you're, you're going to ask the right questions at the mine. I would love to be able to travel around the world and buy gems at source, but that's just not practical uh, at the moment, maybe in the future. That would be great. Um, so I found it was really important to find people that I trust to do that for me um, and to make the relationships at the, um, at the source and to ask the right questions. So um, besides kind of your trip, I mean, you brought you bring up a good point. Not everyone can actually go to the source communities, right? Like you can't always yeah. go directly to. Um, so yeah. you really have to form relationships with your suppliers. Um, yeah. and, and, and there has to be a level of trust, but also kind of um, trust and verify. Um, do you pursue any kind of documentation through your business or through your suppliers? So one of the first things I did was um, approach a company called Levin Sources, who helped me to write a code of conduct, and which was quite a daunting thing, to be honest. There's lots of different areas um, that we wanted to address. And I use this document as like the beginning of a conversation with people. Um, I don't want to put people off. What they actually explained to me is that you shouldn't shut down suppliers because they can't answer all of the questions, but you should enable them to go and ask at their source just like a, a one-way street um so that was really important for me and um have you found a particular uh you you mentioned love and sources as kind of a resource are there any other platforms or resources or uh companies organizations that you have found to be particularly helpful in your i always describe this as a journey it's not a checklist it's not some <laughs> magical you know, like, yeah. oh, now I'm responsible. I've achieved this kind of gold seal yeah. of approval, right? So yeah. are, are there, are there we, we know that's a journey. We all started in a different place. We all kind of like have have our, our particular maybe focus or passion that we yeah. kind of pursue. Are there any um, resources that you consider to be particularly helpful in that journey? So I'm part of a group in the UK called Fair Luxury. And what's amazing about this kind of world of responsible sourcing is we all love sharing information. Like how great is that? The industry before um, I got into the ethical side was quite closed off. People were very private. They didn't want to tell you their sources. Um, but mm. this is like such a big group. You know, we all get together and we, we say where we're getting all our bits from. Mm -hmm. So Fair Luxury, we started doing open houses as well. 
um, in this new virtual world we all live in, we uh, kind of get together and talk about big topics. So I'm happy to share that in the chat um, to open that up to everyone. That's 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 fantastic. Um, I've heard I've heard fair luxury over and over again. So I think that it's a, and one one byproduct of COVID is that we are able to connect kind of more virtually. So it's yeah. not it's not so siloed in the UK, right? Like this is something that we all actually have access to. Kind of some of these resources. Yeah. Um, it's it's yeah. actually opened it up a bit. I think. I, I think so too. I think that I, I would say the same for a number of U.S. organizations as well. It's, yeah. it's become much more global. Um, thank you for sharing. We'll probably have more questions oh, later. Yeah. Um, I'd love to go to Boitsoko um, next. Uh, I hope I, I hope I did that correctly. Um, oh, perfect. <laughs> whose company House of Divinity is based in Botswana. And um, her company, as, as far as I know it, and you can describe a little bit better, um, you sure. make jewelry that is a meld of kind of more contemporary design, but also uh, with African traditional influences. African influences. And yeah. you employ African makers, but you also use responsible materials sourced from the continent as well. So I'd love to hear more about your story. With pleasure. Thank you for the floor, Monica. Um, hello to my fellow participants and our audience. Um, House of Divinity, we are semi-precious stone jewelers based here in Botswana. And my journey as a jeweler really has been quite unorthodox um, and elaborate, but I'll keep it very succinct. Um, it really started off in childhood. I've always had a flair for craft. Shoot straight to what you would call junior high school. I studied art and design and technology, which really gave me an appreciation for working in a workshop setting and working with different materials such as wood and metal. Shoot straight to Varsity, um, where I had adopted beaded jewelry as a hobby and started selling to lecture mates. But it really wasn't until an international relations lecture I had where tragic trade stories from the continent were told. Um, for example, copious amounts of coffee leaving Ethiopia, destined for the international market, being paid for for next to nothing. That's when I realized that I want to dedicate my life to the mission of adding value to raw materials sourced from Africa. Thus then began my journey into manufacturing via jewelry, and it was a natural thing given my flair for craft. Um, HOD then ran on a shoestring budget for what felt like eons, um, and then it was in 2018 that I got angel investment, um, trained in the basics of goldsmithing, private lessons with a goldsmith here at home, and she helped me hone in on jewelry manufacturing, soldering in particular, setting, etc. And that's begun my, you know, my journey in exploring the world of fair trade, as well as this huge faceted gem called responsible um, jewelry manufacturing. And so I find myself in a position where um, HOD, um, we source our materials strictly from the continent. Um, at this point, we're sourcing from Southern Africa. And it's really been an amazing journey of evolution where I have joined different communities that have helped me expand my understanding and appreciation of responsible jewelry and the gem market. It's been quite an honor, actually. So um, I, I love the engraving. Like, I think that is just absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And yeah. Where are your where are most of your um, uh, crafts people located? Like, where uh, are they all over or is there more of a concentration? Thank you for asking that question, Monica. This is essentially our second year in business. Um, our staff complement is very, very minimal. I am the only designer and manufacturer with an occasional production assistant who comes in to help me when we have production pressures. Um, as for the collection you speak of, the engraved collection, that's our latest collection called An Ode to the Originals, which is essentially a cultural and ancestral celebration of our heritage here in Botswana. Um, the rock art is from a sacred place, which is also a United Nations World Heritage Site called Didulo Hills, which I draw inspiration from. And as I evolve as a jeweler and a, res a responsible jeweler, I look forward to, you know, building my commit my you know relationships with the communities from which I source that inspiration. And there's some exciting things in the pipeline. That is so exciting. I have you found it to be. In 
really challenging to enter kind of the global market, like access to, say, U.S., um, European kind of marketplace for your for your designs. What's your primary vehicle for getting uh, your designs kind of into people's hands? Quite the contrary, actually. Um, it's been social media and the digital platforms have been critical in really telling my story and sharing the energy of my brand. Um, and so we've had relative success in um, telling who we are as HOD, our in-house green policy, for example, which is based on pillars of African provenance, ethical um, design, as well as local manufacturing. So social media has been critical um, in our sharing ourselves with the world. So no, there haven't been many impediments, particularly because there's a lot of government and economic stakeholders here in the country who are really helping um, birth a new legacy in a sense that um, is based on the rich diamond heritage that we have as Botswana, really trying to help put Botswana jewelers out there in the world through different trade agreements that, for example, we have with different countries. And so it really feels like it's all hands on deck try and birth a new legacy in that regard and put us out there into the world. So no, it hasn't been quite an impediment. In fact, I'd like to echo Susie and you guys' comments about how COVID-19 has been phenomenal. Um, there's a lot of people in different organizations that have been very key to my understanding of the responsible jewelry world. Um, for example, the executive director of the Responsible Jewelry Council, Iris and I met in some webinar and yeah. she's been phenomenal yeah. in opening up and teaching us about codes of conduct, which I'm really hoping to bring here home at a lot of the associations that I operate with. So digital has been quite a dream. So would you actually say then um, that that the support for Botswana uh, jewelers and that jewelry establishment has kind of uh, maybe a byproduct of the um, sort of gemological wealth that's coming out with like diamonds and, and the development there? Like, is this an offshoot of that? That's a brilliant question. Um, no, it isn't an offshoot. It is a concerted effort to try and develop the downstream um, avenues of the diamond chain. As a country, we have an economic policy of diversification, as well as beneficiation of the resources from you know, diamond mining and other natural resources that we mine. And so we all realize the necessity to try and nurture this industry. However, that is not to say there is not room for improvement when it comes to beneficiation. I personally feel that there's quite a lot of improve, um, room for improvement in that regard, which is where Jewelry Manufacturer Association of Botswana comes in. We are a team of jewelers, gem traders, suppliers of the industry who are concerted in, like I said earlier, birthing a new legacy in this regard. Uh, I, I'm glad you're. I'm. I'm. I'm glad you're there and kind of pushing forward. Um, in in uh, in Tanzania and Kenya, where I usually travel, there there's a beading tradition, but there is not as much of a jewelry making tradition. And so, uh, and there's certainly they they lag way way behind in terms of the processing of the gems themselves. And so. Yeah. It's, it's an uphill battle, but it's one that we continue to kind of try to um, sort of uh, advance yeah, because, because the more you can do in, in country, typically the, the better off that community is. So um, I'm, I'm um, excited to see what you're doing. How did you connect you. with Susan and the conference? How, how, how did that come kind of about? Um, so when I dove into starting to use metals and gems and evolving from the beaded jewelry market. I had a really insatiable appetite for learning any and everything that has to do with sustainability as it pertains to the gem and jewelry market. So there's numerous organizations that I came across and they've been really kind enough to indulge my insatiable curiosity. Um, Fairy Lux has been one of them actually. I haven't joined them as a family, but I look forward to knocking on their door. Um, and so the Chicago Responsible Jewelry Conference has been one of them too. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention AWIMA, which stands for African Women and Mining Association. They are a battalion of warrior women who have really embraced <laughs> me as well and are quite pioneers in the industry. So I think Monica Guchui, who's um, associated with AWIMA, is one of the panelists. So yeah, those are the people that have really opened up to me and refined my appreciation of the industry. 
It's wonderful to have you and to have your vibrant yeah. voice in the room. So thank you so much. It's my much. pleasure. Um, thank you for having me. Yes. Um, and I, I believe that the next panelist uh, we'd like to speak to uh, is also, you know, Susan's the great um, connector, but also recruiter. <laughs> and um, I believe that Mara became, uh, I, I think that you were very interested in the Virtu Gem project and that's maybe how kind of paths sort of cross there. Um, Mara is based in Italy um, and I believe that you have celebrated your eighth, uh, eighth year making jewelry, but I think in a discovery call, I found out that you are actually a philosophy uh, either student or major, I'm not sure how you refer to it um, there, but and that you described it as jewelry found you, which I think a lot of people in the audience can probably relate uh, to that statement alone. Um, and, and that your this ethical pursuit of jewelry is is a necessity in your work, right? Like you, there's no other option coming from your philosophical background. Like you can't you can't separate ethics from the the actual uh, act of of making jewelry. Um, you're a fair trade jewelry, you're a fair trade gold user. Um, and I loved your idea that jewelry um, doesn't just bring beauty into lives, but it, there's, it's this combination of kind of ethics and aesthetics um, kind of combined. So uh, I'd love to hear more about your uh, journey kind of into jewelry and, and responsibility and that idea that like every choice is kind of being driven by this ethical approach. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. And most of all, Monica, thank you for this beautiful introduction. Really, I have no words. Thank you. Um, long story short, my coming to, jewelry, to the industry of jewelry um, has been really unintended, as, as, as have you said. Um, my one and only and holy background is in philosophy, for I am a self-taught designer and maker. And my story, I think I can, I can describe it as the story of the kindness of strangers over and over in time. Uh, as uh, when I started back in 2012, I had, I had no knowledge nor contacts. And therefore, I, because of my philosophy studies, I have, um, how can I say, I, I, was, I was trained to question fearlessly and to uh, be, comfortable in dealing with uncomfortable questions. I know it is strange to, to say, but that's, that's exactly how it worked. And at the end, it turned out to be extremely useful. Um, I don't know exactly how I started um, dealing with jewelry, but I found I love jewelry because it can be used as a medium and as a, a, a symbol and not only as an adornment of the body, as a piece of jewelry can, I think it can hold a different and many layers of meanings. And I think that that was um, what really captured my philosophy students' attention. Uh, when I started, I didn't have the knowledge, let alone the money. So I started with brass and, and, and silver, those, those cheap things. Uh, but later on, when I, discover that that was my road that was what i liked and that i was really want that i really want to use purchase materials mm. i've said um going for responsible sourced uh, materials was the only option for me it was an eerie it wasn't not even really an option but a necessity as when someone asked me why i went through this decision which was quite unusual in italy back in 2016 mm -hmm. i really didn't have an answer as it was something that simply happened in my mind just because of thinking but I like to describe it as a, as a coherence burden, as uh, for I needed to be able to apply um, an ethic that was adequate, an adequate analog to, uh, to um, aesthetic. So my concern was and still is that my mind really can place beauty apart from what is true and what is good. And so that's the reason why I, I come through uh, this path of the of the jewelry world. And as Susie said, um, one of the, the key movement in this journey was, um, was um, 
knowing the people behind the Fair Luxury Group as uh, by attending their conferences, I really, um, I really went through uh, an in-depth knowledge of what was in the back door of our industry, of what was happening in the producing countries. And at the same time, I had a chance to um, easily find suppliers for for gemstones and, and diamonds. For you know, when you start a business, what seemed to be hard at the end turns out to be the easiest part, and what is meant to be simple turned out to be hard. For yeah. for the first thing I did was trying to uh, put my hands on fair trade gold as to me it was the simplest thing. I had this UK supplier and he was selling fair trade gold. So I really thought it was in my, I really had this childish thought that I only had to do some black work, but it was um, a huge journey for the issue. Yeah, if you still ask me what was the hardest challenge I've ever experienced throughout all these years, I would say fair trade gold. And even though it wasn't supposed to be so hard, uh, yeah. But the point is that in Italy at the time, uh, the product wasn't on market. So when I first wrote to uh, First Trade International as First Trade Italy, they didn't even mention gold on, the, on their website. The answer I got was, no, you had had to wait. But I'm not the kind of person who takes no's and gives up. So I had mm -hmm. to wrote to First Trade UK as the gold I was willing to buy was from a UK supplier. And that was a key moment as I had the chance to meet uh, Victoria Hull, who at the time was the product manager for gold in UK. And she, I don't know how she, she was touched by my email, by my desire to, uh, to jump in the calls and she find a way, I don't know, I really don't know how she did to make me able to use virtual gold and claim it as virtual gold. And that whole thing started. Yeah. Um, how how challenging has it been? So um, on the on the U.S. side, uh, Fairmind is a is a bit more accessible. There's really only a couple of North American uh, jewelers that I think use Fair Trade Gold. How 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 has the supply been? Um, and I've I've heard some stories about Fair Trade Gold getting a little bit. Like I, a lot of a lot of designers are like so happy to discover that there's actually like fair trade or fair mind and go through the licensing process, but beyond that, you also have um, you know sort of supply and and some some of those issues. So how how is fair trade doing? How are you able to navigate that now currently? Mm, oh, that, that that's that's a question. Uh, well, <laughs> there's to say that I, I don't use uh, enormous quantities, so I've never faced the issue of being in need of gold and not actually being able to have it. Um, during this period, uh, well, I, there was a moment in early spring when all the suppliers were, were closed, and for a period of one month or one, one, more, one month and a half, it wasn't it wasn't possible to buy some first of the gold at all but um I'm always in contact with them and they are assuring me that um the gold is actually arriving for it seems there's nothing to be scared of okay I mean, when this scheme is settled in the country and you are able to um, acquire your licensee the system at the end is extremely easy Okay, that's that, that's good to know. That might be helpful for people who feel like they're they're unable to or unwilling to kind of tackle that challenge to at least understand that 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 may not be the most uh, challenging, yeah. most difficult. No, I think it's really helpful for me as well. I I like your uh you're you're like. I'm someone that like, no, is only, you know, only means so much to like, that's a challenge. I think that that's a, that's a, that's a big uh, continuity with a lot of designers that I know who are really, really passionate about pursuing responsible um, practices and sources. Like you can't take no, you know, you, you, you can't take no as your final answer, right? Like you have to kind of keep digging and keep pushing. I think that when you don't have the connections, when you don't have the money nor the resources, and you have a dream and you are extremely passionate about that dream, I mean, everything, every issue, 
I mean, you have to face them. It doesn't matter. You, you, you yeah. find a way. It's really, it's, it's up to you. And it's so. Um, I, I've had a lot of conversations in the last few months with designers um, who, um, you know, are from, you know, black indigenous people of color, particularly where they are not third generation jewelers. They are not, they don't, they didn't inherit anything. They didn't come from a jewelry family. So the idea of these these barriers and that you have to actually be so resilient and you have to kind yeah. of, jewelry, jewelry can have, a, a, there's a, uh, I'm, I'm, the word is escaping me, but there can be um, such a, a, an old, like, sorry, old club sort of uh, like mentality. And I think uh, a couple of you have mentioned like the opacity, like there was this deliberate kind of opacity. And I feel like transparency is so important. And I feel like things are maybe opening up a little bit, but it's because people yeah. keep knocking, <laughs> knocking on the door. <laughs> No, and I think that, is, and then that happens in my country, which is Italy, that industry is really, as you have said, close, but very traditional for once someone really knocks on the door and want to um, source differently. And even though, you know, the, the, what, what you may have accomplished, you are really looked as, um, I, don't, I don't have the English word proper for that, I'm sorry. But you're not located in the proper way, so <laughs> you're you're doing you're doing great. Um, all right, I would like to move on to um, Bob and actually gold. The, the the idea of gold is a good segue to Bob uh, Donofrio. Did I say that correctly? That's good. Um, and you are with uh, you, you're you're based in New Jersey, but I think that you actually have a tie to. Uh, to Italy, um, I think we were discussing uh, with uh, your background. I think you were uh, you worked in fashion. Roberto Cavalli, um, you launched. Is everyone um, muted? Um, you launched the Novato jewelry line, and then moved from there into kind of high jewelry, uh, Bulgari, Afre, and Gerard. Um, and uh, you describe yourself, uh, uh, you're not so much a maker, you are a business guy who is solving a problem with your jewelry and your jewelry line. And that problem is gold um, and the presence of mercury and gold. So uh, I love the fact that Futura, like, um, it's kind of this bridge between um, kind of like it's it's really about knowledge of the issue and going out and pursuing um, you use Fairmind Gold and um, you use jewelry historians to kind of create these capsule collections of the most beautiful gold jewelry um, but it's Fairmind Gold um, and I'd love to hear a little bit more particularly around capacity because I think that's something that you're pretty passionate about. Uh, yes, so I'm not a, I'm not a designer, that's for sure. Um, can you hear me? Okay, I'm gonna. Oh boy, I think you lost me. Can Can you hear me? Oh, we We can hear you and see you. I okay. I can hear you and see you. Okay, so. <laughs> So my journey was a strange journey because uh, I was working in Rome, Italy at the time with Kogge Pamalov. Uh, and then I was recruited and hired by Bulgari. Um, they taught me the jewelry business while I was there another year in the gem business. And then they sent me off to North America to be the president of their North American company. So that was my start. And, um, you know, once I came into the jewelry, um, I was bitten like everybody else who was here who are designers by the fact that it is... Um, um, it's a it's an industry that is an industry of joy, an industry of happiness, and, and something that I was proud to be part of. Um, I then did work for other companies, as you said, okay, primarily in the luxury jewelry business. And uh, I also did a lot of consulting uh, in that area. So it was about four years ago when I was actually looking at the industry to look at what was the industry missing. And um, as I was going through that process is where the whole issue of gold came up for me. Um, 
and I didn't know anything about it. And the, for everybody who's in, been in the industry for a long, long time understands that gold mining is somewhat of a dirty industry. Uh, and um, large scale and medium scale gold mining isn't necessarily a problem, but um, some of the small scale miners around the world, which supply a lot to the fair trade and fair mind organizations, there are about 15 million of them, um, continue to use old practices. And those practices are to use mercury and as they extract the gold from the ore and from uh, the substrate, and they use also cyanide. I hadn't been aware of that, believe it or not, 30 years plus in the business, and I never really knew or understood anything about it. So I just first educated myself. Um, I educated myself through Fairmind first. Uh, I then went to the UN, and I am a, a member of a partner of the UN uh, partnership, which is the GEF program uh, and the Planet Gold program. And um, simultaneously with all, with all that, the UN um, did form the Minamata Convention, which focuses on specifically um, the small scale gold miners around the world because they, unfortunately, because of the practices that they have learned over generations and generations, they are responsible for about 40% of the mercury emissions that the world suffers today. And uh, the United Nations certainly has declared this a major problem. They formed this convention, 124 countries are members of this convention. And the purpose is that within a certain time frame, I believe it's about 15 years or so, to eliminate mercury from the small scale gold mining situation. So when I found all this out, um, and then I did talk to some people in the industry that I knew, uh, I realized that um, I had to form Futura because there was no other avenue. So uh, as I said, I'm a businessman, I'm not, I'm not a designer. And one of the things that I was looking at from the standpoint of the consumer at the time was that the consumer really didn't have much choice. In other words, they would buy brands that had a look and a style. Um, but uh, the truth is, if they were things that that particular designer or particular creative director thought was appropriate. So I came up with the idea that I would use jewelry historians to go back through the 6,000 years of history that we have in jewelry and find what we thought could be timeless designs. We use a group of uh, a curation panel of women that help us once we identify products that are possible to produce um, to then give us ideas about what is today modern relevant. So the jewelry you'll find on my website, on the Futura website, is jewelry that comes from as far back as two and 3,000 years ago and as recent as mid-century. Uh, and when it comes to mid-century things, um, we uh, talk to the estates and we get permission from the estates of these designers uh, and license uh, the right to produce their jewelry. So um, why Futura? And I always say Futura found me. Uh, I, I didn't find it. Um, the word has to get out. Um, the United Nations, my part in the United Nations uh, program is really um, one of consumerism because the battle, if you talk to all the experts who are on the supply chain side, is fought here. It's fought where we all are operating, all of us on this call and everybody else uh, who's trying to do good things. Uh, and we all have the ear of our client. Uh, and and, and that's, where, that's where the battle is fought. And that's where the battle will be won according to the experts. So my role in this is really first um, uh, the mission of communication. Um, and, and then more importantly, I'm working on the backside on trying to um, uh, ramp up the supply chain, okay, and scale this a little bit because right now for the gold that I use, and the gold that I use is mercury free uh, and along with all of those other social concerns taken care of inside of it. And I did that obviously because the mission of Futura is, is, is hopefully to help with this issue of mercury emissions. Um, everybody else in the jewelry industry, nobody's doing anything terrible, unlike some of the other industries. I mean, we're doing our best. People who use recycled gold, people who use fair trade, fair mine, it's all, it's all, it's all good, it's all first steps. But um, the truth is that we as an industry can do better. Uh, that's what I hope Futura will, will start, that um, as the supplies of this gold which right now, this certified fair mine ecological gold that I use, there's only about 40 kilos available in a year. 
comes from three minds. Um, so you understand the smallness of which we're talking about. And that's why some of those larger brands that if they could, uh, would probably bring more consumers, okay, to the process and to the, and to the issue. Uh, but they can't because they're just not out there. So um, Futura's mission um, is a tough one, like everybody else talked about. Uh, and as tough as it is, you see me smiling because I've never had as much fun in my life. I, and I had all those career opportunities with all these big brands, but at the end of the day, doing this is the most rewarding thing anybody can do. So I applaud all the people who are here with me on the panel and all the many others that I've talked to around the world who are doing the right things in their own little way. Um, and eventually it's gonna all come around full circle. Um, my mission, however, um, remains, yes, I'm gonna make beautiful jewelry. Yes, I'm gonna try to make jewelry that people will have a reason to call to action to come back and look at, primarily because as crazy as it seems, the, the jewelry is the answer to this major worldly problem. And most people look at jewelry as being, you know, a very luxurious kind of opportunity, people with money and things. However, it has this other major now goal attached to it, which is, guess what? It's what's going to take us out of this problem of these mercury emissions. And, and I'm not going into the issue of mercury emissions because there's plenty written out there about it. But I just want us all to know, everybody who comes from a lot of different countries around here, right on this panel, all of our countries, all of our people, all of our children suffer from it. And um, we, the people who are here and the people listening, are, are part of the solution and we are the solution. So that's the story of Futura. And it's a and it's a beautiful story. And um, I, uh, Andrea uh, Hill chimed in on the chat that uh, you are a designer, Bob. You are designing a better way of business, and um, we we all contribute kind of in our in our own ways. And I think we have to celebrate the small the small gains, the small successes, because, you know, in um, in aggregate, we, we actually are making kind of, you know, a, a, a bigger impact, even though everything, it feels like a slog and it feels like it's um, so small, um, so insurmountable. Um, uh, and I, I appreciate the fact that you are also um, with your work with the UN and you are, you are really working towards um, we need we need to talk about the other side of this, which is, um, you know, we can we can make great choices, and it's important to kind of celebrate the the again kind of celebrate these like small wins uh, along the way, but the there is more power to designers as well and and manufacturers in the storytelling because it's how we communicate. It's it's creating demand for that market we need to kind of grow that market and when we do that we are actually green lighting things like fair mind fair trade all of those small producers all of those like moyo gems miners like when we say we want your stuff and we are able to maybe even link together in more efficient ways than we have been able to in the past we are we are green lighting those markets and we are saying we want we want your materials and they're trust me i've been on the ground in these places they are so motivated by that they are, they are so excited by that now if i know there's a market for my gems or my gold that is fair and that actually protects me from mercury um for instance um they though they they do want to participate in the system and i i feel like that's the other part of designing is not just the materials you use and not just the practices in your studio but creating that demand through your storytelling through all of these connections um so um that was going to be my wrap up but i got a little um inspired by bob and kind of <laughs> <laughs> went into that. Um, I would love to maybe take uh, a few questions from the chat if there's anything that has surfaced. Um, I, I've been trying to monitor, but I also am trying to focus on your faces and kind of enjoy this time uh, of hearing your stories. Um, if there are questions, if you could drop them in the chat and maybe Susan or uh, Andrea could maybe flag them or bring them to my attention. Um, but uh, I also just wanted to ask um, the panelists if 
the current situation at 2020 has clearly been a, a little bit more challenging year. And these um, responsible sort of choices and journeys are challenging enough, even in the best of times. And I'm just wondering, are there any effects of COVID or even, you know, racial justice and equity um, in the supply chain? Are there any any things that have come up for you in the last, um, you know, few months that that you'd like to share in terms of either difficulties or um, maybe small wins? I could go ahead and do so. Is Andrea talking? Su S Susie, you're muted. Susie, yeah. Okay, there we go. There we go. <laughs> muted. No, still muted. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Trying to turn uh, this weird new world we've got into a bit of a positive and knowing our supply chain, one of the first things we wanted to do is like check in how people are doing. Um, we, uh, we're we working with uh, Turquoise Mountain in Myanmar and they their goldsmiths actually brought their benches home with them. So they were working from home. Um, and so we wanted to like just kind of support those communities. So we kind of did a little pre-order with them just to kind of give them a little cash injection. Um, and then we're working with Brian Cook with his community out in Bahia. And so we're coming up with a way of adding kind of a bit of community, um, like a way to give money to the community added into the jewelry. So when you're buying the piece of jewelry, you're also adding money back to that community that needs extra support right now, to be honest. Um, so that's that's our focus for this bit going forward. Yeah, I have something to add to that as well, if I may. Um, my experiences during COVID-19 have been, obviously there have been major disruptions to my production and rather supply chain. Um, given the scale of my business, which is pretty minimal at this point, there haven't been huge impediments in continuing my production. In fact, I wanna focus on the opportunities that have come up because of COVID-19. I think I echoed some of them earlier, that there's been this greater sense of community amongst not only Judas, but the entirety of the industry in general and really opening up. And I think if we were to ride this momentum of evolution and our heart chakras opening up, it really will lead to impactful change. So I think there's been quite a lot of opportunities and um, my heart and my energies go out to everybody who has been uh, you know, adversely affected. And I look forward to coming on board different initiatives that I heard Andrea and Susan talking about um, at the beginning of the conference. Um, for example, the girls who need support in Zimbabwe, I think it's just this sense of community getting stronger. So yeah, I think that's been one of the opportunities that I choose to focus. I, I would agree that there's been uh, an increased kind of uh, just a connection um, yeah. globally, um, people using platforms and communities. I think someone mentioned in the chat earlier, like um, th these are ways that like events like this, we where we yeah. can actually connect with our you know, our people, the the people who we're passionate about. And there's lots of smaller offshoots, like supporting the Zimbabwean, uh, you know, yeah. women affected by these Girls. things. So um, there, there are some incredible outlets, I think, that is sort of an interesting byproduct of, of COVID. Um, and I think a, a lot of people's supply chains and, and labor um, chains have, have been somewhat impacted. impacted. Yeah. Um, so we also had we had a question from Clara um, just recently. What does it take for miners who are already registered with Fair Mine Fair Trade to switch to Mercury Free? Presumably, it is expensive for them. And I don't know if anyone on this panel is a bit more technical in that. Maybe Bob. Um, I'm not sure if you might have an answer for that. You're muted, Bob. Oh, I'm muted. Okay. Let's see. How am I doing that? Uh, let me see. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, um, look at um, the, 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 it is a big cost, okay, because of, of traceability. So, at the mine itself, okay, and when you're buying fair, fair mined uh, ecological gold, or if you're just buying fair mine gold, okay, um, you're paying a premium. Um, and it seems like nothing at the start, uh, $6,000 a kilo, okay, is the premium for one kilo of uh, fair mined ecological gold. Um, however, by the time that gold gets shipped, because it's 
you know, one kilo. Then when you ship it, brinks and all that stuff and all of the handling and things that goes through between there and eventually cleaning it up to 99%, eventually um, doing the 18 uh, carat at the refinery, it's costing me probably somewhere close to 40% more for that gold than it is for, I will call it normal gold, dirty gold, whatever you want to call it, okay? So uh, it's, a, it's a real impediment. And, and one of the things, quite frankly, that I'm, I'm working on, because I'm, I'm on the Fairmine Standards Board, is to try and eliminate that premium and instead because um, when Fairmind opens up the markets to the miners, they're getting a much higher price for their gold even without the premium. And so going forward, we're trying to work on, um, I'll say, a system where maybe that premium can be reduced so more people can afford to, to do it, okay? And I've just got to tell you, again, just because everyone here saw it, has the same problem, uh, that premium, I, I can't mark up in the price of the jewelry or else I would be not competitive. So it's one of those things that, again, we all talked about labors of love. Um, we've got to get the word out. And that means sometimes sacrificing margins. And that's also another thing that some of the bigger brands will have to face unless we're able, okay, to get that gold back down to the commodity it is. You know, gold is gold, no different than pork belly is pork belly. And eventually that's really where we have to get. To. But for right now, um, for someone wanting to get in, uh, it, there's a little bit of an expense uh, that's involved. Thank you. Thank you for kind of weighing in there. And um, there have been a, a couple of questions around um, kind of the idea of mining. And there's a negative uh, connotation to a lot of younger consumers to anything that's mined. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering if any of you could have addressed that in your communication with your with your clients, um, uh, there's been some great conversation around this in the chat, but if, if you have an approach or you have uh, a, um, you know, a, a, a particular angle or storytelling, I think some of you use gemstones or Fairmind or fair trade Gold where you can actually tell that positive story, but if you have an example from that, we would love to hear it. Um, I just want to make sure I got the question right. You were talking about communicating. Monica, can you hear me? Okay. Um, you're talking about um, communicating to conscious customers, um, mining versus, for example, lab-created gems. Is that what we're talking about? Understood. Okay. Well, coming from a diamond mining country, for example, um, the entirety of our community, our, our economy, is built on diamond mining. So naturally, it's one of our... It is our biggest resource. Um, we are, however, the jewelers that I operate with realize the profundity and the sustainability of lab created diamonds. And we are eager to serve clients when they're ready and they ask for it. But we have our preference for natural diamonds. Um, and I think that's just where I stand with the situation. Um, sorry, there's always a little bit of a lag. I heard that little interference. <laughs> Um, so I, I think um, we've gotten the one minute warning um, yeah. that, that the, the whole mining versus recycled versus um, uh, lab, lab you know, those are big, big questions, right? Like that we yeah. are still in the process of answering. And uh, I, I would just like to go back to that idea, though, if we are all talking about the positives that can come from not all artisanal mining is illegal, not all artisanal mining is bad, right? We need to get good at even large scale mining is not necessarily a bad thing in the way that it's approached. We have to be able to kind of maybe name specific projects, um, Bahia, Moyo, um, Fairmine, Fairtrade, 
in order yeah. to actually be able to tell that positive story. I think that if you have a chance to have a conversation with someone, they yeah. will actually um, listen and kind of engage on that. So um, oh, it looks like if, if people are willing to stick around in 15 minutes, ask a minor anything is going to be uh, the, the next session. How, what perfect segue is that? I have to thank you all. I have to thank you all so much for not just showing up for the panel, but just showing up, showing up <laughs> in your work and in your lives and, and making these choices that are not easy and we can all learn from. And thank you for your the, the color and the beauty and the, the incredible things that you produce and put out in the world. We. We are, we're not going to wear burlap and sackcloth anytime soon. We have to do better. Jewelry has to do better because humans want to adorn. So thank you for adorning us so beautifully. Thank you all. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like, so like Rob like lighted us today. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.